Hi, welcome to Bookie, which unlock big ideas from world bestsellers in audio, text, and mind map. Please download Bookie at Apple Store or Google Play with more features, get your free mind snack now. Today we will unlock F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby. The book tells the story of the millionaire Jay Gatsby's tragic attempts to rekindle a lost romance. In 1998, the U.S. publisher Modern Library invited several critics to nominate the top 100 English novels of the century. The Great Gatsby came in second after James Joyce's Ulysses. The American poet and critic T.S. Eliot called it the first step that American fiction has taken since Henry James, while the renowned director and choreographer Tony Tanner crowned it the supreme American novel. The novel is a staple in the U.S. middle school curriculum and beloved across the country. However, when it was first published, this seminal work of literature met with a lukewarm reception. At the time, F. Scott Fitzgerald's earlier novels, This Side of Paradise and The Beautiful and The Damned, had already won him acclaim as a writer. Compared to those two works, The Great Gatsby was a commercial failure, selling fewer than 20,000 copies. It wasn't until decades later, after the Second World War, that the novel started to gain popularity. It would later become a bestseller, continuing to sell millions of copies through the 21st century. The Great Gatsby describes American society during the 1920s. After the First World War, the U.S. economy was booming. Evidence of lavish entertainment and celebration could be seen everywhere. And many people indulged their hedonistic, decadent lifestyles, straying from traditional moral and ethical constraints. Fitzgerald christened this era the Jazz Age. His writing presents an objective view of the pleasure-seeking conditions he witnessed. That's why he became known as the chronicler and poet laureate of the period. The novel identifies and defines the vibrant spirit of the Jazz Age. The book contrasts the luxury of the living conditions with the tragic story of a failed love. Going far beyond the romance itself, the novel delves into the inevitable destruction caused by the relentless pursuit of the American dream. In this bookie, we will introduce The Great Gatsby in three parts. Part 1 summarizes the main plot and introduces the tragic and elusive Gatsby. In Part 2, we analyze the character of Gatsby and why he is described as great. Finally, Part 3 talks about the historical background of the novel and F. Scott Fitzgerald's life experiences. These help us understand the backstory of the book's conception. Part 1, Mad About Daisy and Broken Dreams on Long Island Although the protagonist of The Great Gatsby is Jay Gatsby himself, the novel is narrated by his neighbor, Nick Carraway. Nick comes from a well-to-do family in the Midwest. After the First World War, the region is devastated, and in 1922, Nick heads for New York to learn about the bond business. Nick rents a place to live in a small town near New York, located to the east of the city. His home is on one of two narrow oddly shaped peninsulas of similar size, East Egg and West Egg. Nick's home in West Egg is in between two palatial mansions. And, the mansion on the right, a factual imitation of some Hotel de Ville in Normandy, is the residence of Jay Gatsby. Across the bay, in the more fashionable East Egg, there is an exquisite white building resembling a palace. It is the home of Gatsby's one-time sweetheart Daisy, and the man she later married, Tom Buchanan. Daisy is Nick's distant cousin. Tom, a national athlete, is the son of an affluent family, the confident heir to a fortune. Tom is also Nick's long-term friend, his college classmate. The story begins that summer when Nick receives an invitation from the Buchanans to dinner at their mansion. When Nick arrives for dinner, he finds Daisy is lounging on an enormous couch with another woman, Jordan Baker, a golf champion. After learning that Nick lives in West Egg, Jordan mentions that she knows Gatsby, Nick's neighbor. However, dinner is announced, and the topic of Gatsby is cut short. When a phone call interrupts the meal, the atmosphere becomes tense. The call is for Tom, and he goes off to speak. Daisy remains at the table and continues her normal chat with the other guests at the table. But, not for long. Suddenly, she stands up and goes over to where Tom is taking on the phone. While both the party hosts are out of the room, Jordan informs Nick that Tom is having an affair and that the call will be his mistress on the line. 
On a later occasion, Nick and Tom take the train to New York City together. Tom leads Nick through an outlying derelict area to meet his mistress. Her name is Myrtle, and she is married to the owner of an auto repair garage called George Wilson. Tom visits the repair shop under the pretense of selling his car. Secretly, he invites Myrtle over to his apartment back in the city. Myrtle invites her sister, Catherine and the McKees, a couple who live downstairs, to come along as well. At the apartment, everyone has a pleasant evening, drinking and chatting in the living room. Catherine says she once went to one of Gatsby's parties at his mansion. She brings up the rumor that Gatsby is related to the German emperor. Before she can flesh out her experience, she is cut short. Her remarks are the prelude to Nick receiving an invitation to a banquet at the Gatsby mansion where he will himself make Gatsby's acquaintance. Every Friday, a New York fruit vendor delivers crates of fruit to the Gatsby mansion. The mansion's spacious gardens are brilliantly lit, festooned like a giant Christmas tree. And buffet tables are garnished with an array of mouth-watering delicacies. The bar in the main salon, well stocked with all kinds of liquor, has a solid brass rail. At 7 p.m. sharp, the orchestra strikes up. Gatsby's Rolls Royce is like a public bus, shuttling the extravagantly dressed party guests back and forth, from nine in the morning through to midnight. The melody of laughter and people's lively chat fills the main hall, drawing room, balcony, and garden. Most of the guests show up unannounced and leave too, without even seeing Gatsby in person. Nick is one of the few actually invited. His invitation, delivered by a chauffeur in a blue uniform, was very formal. At the bottom of the invitation card, the host signed his name in a majestic hand, J. Gatsby. Why did Nick get his special invitation? Nick, himself, is not sure of the reason. At the party, he runs into Jordan again, but he cannot find Gatsby. He and Jordan chat with other guests about their elusive host. There are many rumors about him. This time, people say that Gatsby is a murderer and a German spy. Nick feels increasingly confused. What is Gatsby really like? Just when Nick gives up searching for Gatsby, unexpectedly, he appears. While the party revelers are engrossed in a performance, a stranger wanders over to Nick and strikes up a conversation. The stranger says that he just bought a hydroplane and invites Nick to go for a jaunt in it with him. Of course, this stranger is none other than the great Gatsby. As it turns out, Nick saw Gatsby once before. On his way back home from the Buchanan's the other night, he saw a man standing on the lawn, gazing up at the night sky. Nick considered approaching him to introduce himself. But, suddenly, the man made a strange gesture. In the dark, Nick saw him open his arms towards the sea. He attempted to embrace the green light in the distance coming from the Buchanan's dock far away on the shore of East Egg. A moment later, the man was swallowed by the darkness. The man was Gatsby. After his first real encounter with Gatsby, Nick continues to hear rumors about his past. According to Jordans, Gatsby claimed that he attended Oxford University, but she doesn't believe him. Nick agrees. He doesn't believe that Gatsby comes from an affluent family. To Nick, Gatsby looks like one of the ghetto dwellers of Louisiana, or East Side, New York. After several meetings, Nick becomes increasingly convinced that Gatsby's origins are not so special. Nick considers that Gatsby's lavish entertainments still make him little more than the proprietor of a fancy restaurant. In one of Nick and Gatsby's meetings, Gatsby volunteers some information about his background. He claims that he comes from an affluent family in San Francisco. He describes the city as being in the Midwest. He affirms that he went to Oxford, following the family tradition. After his parents died, he inherited a vast sum of money. To blank out the sudden loss of his beloved parents, he undertook a tour of the capital cities of Europe like a young Raja, collecting jewels, hunting, and painting. However, Gatsby's account is full of inconsistencies. Nick has to restrain himself from laughing. One notable and glaring error is the location of San Francisco, not in the Midwest, but on the west coast of the U.S. Notwithstanding other irregularities, Nick finds Gatsby's account of the war credible. Gatsby started as a lieutenant and, thanks to his outstanding performance, rose through the ranks to major. 
Towards the end of his account, Gatsby raises his voice and shakes his head with a grim smile, as if recalling the hardships of the battlefield. His demeanor is assured speaking of his army days, different from how he trips over his words when describing his time at Oxford. Later, he shows Nick the medals he was awarded by the Allied governments, as well as the photographs he took at Oxford. Nick finally believes all the details of Gatsby's life story. There is one simple reason why Gatsby confides all this information to Nick and treats him so magnanimously. He wants Nick to arrange a meeting with Daisy at Nick's home. Today we are just sharing limited content. To unlock more key insights of world-class bestseller please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play, get your free mind snack now.